Exactly. Um, it is a good time for us to get started. I'm going to introduce myself and then thank several individuals here. But before we get started, I'm going to ask everybody who is not speaking to mute themselves and to remain muted. Um, uh, the question and answer uh, is going to be around via the chat. So if you can put the chat, the, your questions into the chat section, and we are going to read them at the end. I think that is going to help everybody so we don't get any feedback noise. So let me start with good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm so excited that we have such a nice turnout for today's event, uh, virtual that is. My name is Joe Mochnik. I'm the Dean of Libraries here at North Dakota State University. And I'm so excited that we have an opportunity today to share some stories and to learn a little bit more about Leo Kim, his tremendous work, and about the collection that the NDSU archives have been curating since the fall of 2019. So I would like to start with uh, sharing some appreciation to several of the individuals here who have helped us bring this far. So I have noticed that my, uh, my boss is here, Margaret Fitzgerald. I would like to start with thanking the provost's office and the president's office for helping and shepherding this donation and bringing us to, to uh, this stage where we are right now. I think that has been instrumental and I think it's very much appreciated. I would like to then continue with my thanks uh, and uh, mention the Friends of the NDSU Libraries Group. NDSU Libraries have established the Friends Group last year. And in many ways, this may be considered as the inaugural event for the Friends of the Libraries Group. If you are not a member of the Friends, this may be an opportunity for you to consider. You can find us on the website. You can reach out to me, to Lindsay, and we'll certainly be able to help you and connect. I, we believe that we have many friends. The friends of the group is kind of formalizing those friendship relationships and really help us move forward. So for the next group of people who I would like to thank, really, I'm going to start with the um, graduate assistant in the communications department. His name is Noah Peters, and he is graduating this spring, but he has been working with the NDSU archives and, and libraries since last summer. And I think in many ways, the, if you have not seen or if you have seen the exhibit, the exhibit is really kind of a product of his hard work he has held with processing and he is really responsible for many of the wonderful things that have happened since the um, since the last year that, that that work was going on perhaps even more importantly i need to share with you our appreciation my appreciation to mike smith so mike smith has been volunteering with ndsu archives since fall 2019 and guess what, we counted the hours, we are keeping track and he has put 648 hours into his um, volunteering that is mostly processing and exhibit work. This is spectacular. Mike, I'm so appreciative. Thank you so much for all of the effort. You have really helped us have Leo Kim connections as we have um, a collection as we have today. And I really appreciate your work. Two special individuals uh, have, a, have a very prominent place uh, that need to be mentioned today. They are. Mary Roth and Kevin Smith. They have facilitated the original donation in 2019. And I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart that they have uh, uh, identified this collection that has particular value. They have connected NDSU, North Dakota State University with Leo Kemp and ensured that we all have an opportunity to do wonderful work and really to uh, take care of this collection and tell stories into the future. On the list of people that I need to thank is certainly the foundation who has helped with this. Uh, I did mention our senior administration, all of the staff in the library, uh, especially as special thanks goes to, to Lindsay Condry. She has been the brainchild behind all, all, all of the work that was going on. We also have a um, exhibits committee and several other individuals who have helped as well. So as we are thinking, um, everybody, I would also like to tell you that during the homecoming this year, we are going to have an in-person event. So um, the desire is that this is going to be just a precursor of the wonderful gathering that we are going to have in the fall without masks and hopefully in a, in a, in a, a very exciting um, environment. And I would like you to encourage to visit the main library here at NDSU because we are going to have uh, Leo Kim's work on display. The display is scheduled to be open in June and we would like to make sure that you come stop by, visit and, and enjoy the exhibit. This event is being recorded. Uh, I'm asking you again to be muted while the presentation goes on. And it's my distinct privilege to hand it over to Dr. Ross Collins, who is going to introduce the panel and he's going to start with the panel. Dr. Collins. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Joe. Um, welcome. I'm, I'm kind of delighted and almost shocked to have the opportunity to do this today because while I knew uh, Leo Kim somewhat, you know, I didn't know him as well as some people, uh, but uh, I'm uh, happy to be here. I, I pre pre prepared a few remarks about Leo, just a few minutes to kind of give us a little bit of a background and perhaps remind us some of the things that we had forgotten about him. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to I'm going to read that to you. Um, Leo, as most of you know, was one of the region's most uh, well-known and probably most well-loved photographer uh, photographers over 40 years. Um, and I think he brought a, a unique background and a special way of seeing on a life that began in China shortly after World War II. Um, he had what I call harrowing and difficult circumstances in his early life, living in uh, Hong Kong and Macau and Austria. Uh, his parents were actually Korean before deciding to uh, move to the United States. And uh, Leo said he targeted Fargo because North Dakota have a reputation for a more reasonable standard of living and because NDSU tuition was also reasonable and the state was noted for its wide open spaces. And I presume that Leo probably had <clears throat> very few experiences with empty space, having made his way through the dense populations of Asia and Europe. Um, Leo brought uh, photography experience from, from Europe to his time at NDSU when he worked for the Spectrum and the yearbook. He moved on to the forum and become, uh, part, became part of one of the region's top photojournalism teams during that era. Um, Leo left the newspaper to pursue a career in commercial photography that brought him really to the top of his field. He had a reputation for meticulous craftsmanship, both behind the camera and in the darkroom. In addition to the 35 millimeter format, Leo worked with the large format cameras, the things that require patience, special care, and a thoughtful, methodical approach to making images. Leo moved his commercial business to Minneapolis area, living in St. Paul, but he clearly never lost the lure of the North Dakota prairie. And in the 1990s returned again and again to capture the haunting, empty serenity of rural America with his large format camera. His images became a book published in 2003 called North Dakota Prairie Landscape. In 2010, Leo refocused his work on his urban environment, publishing St. Paul Serenity. And while the photos are from the city, uh, they do evoke, I think, the feeling of a timeless serenity, even in the urban density. Um, Leo tragically was diagnosed with a brain tumor that cut short his storied legacy, and he died in 2019. His extensive collection was donated to the NDSU archives. It becomes part of NDSU's growing specialty in regional photography. And I'd just like to point out that uh, I encourage other area photographers to consider donating to the NDSU's collection. Uh, I would like to see the NDSU collection grow to be one of the nation's premier uh, archives of photography, and I think we can do that. Uh, Fargo has a legacy of produce, producing great photographers that goes back literally to the beginning 150 years ago. So I would talk, I introduce my, uh, the panelists, and then I'll ask them to talk a little bit about how they knew Leo. Uh, in, I'll do it in alphabetical order. Colburn Viston is a retired forum photo chief and former president of the National Press Photographers Association. Dan Keck is a retired NDSU University relations photographer and well-known freelance photographer for many national publications. Dave Sampson is a former a forum photojournalist whose work has won many regional and national press photography awards. Dave Wallace is a retired forum photographer whose work spans nearly 50 years, maybe more. He was a, an NDSU student who first met Leo during his time at the university. So uh, I'll begin by asking the panelists a little bit uh, of um, how they, they knew Leo and we'll consider uh, Leo's uh, influence and legacy and some of the challenges that Leo faced. And the panelists will talk for about 35 minutes and then we hope to have an opportunity for questions from our virtual audience. So maybe I'll begin uh, with Colburn in alphabetical order and, and ask uh, how you came to know Leo Kim. I'm on mute there. Well, I came to the forum in 1968 
and uh, shortly thereafter took over the management of the photo department. And in the early uh, to mid 70s, uh, Rio joined our staff and uh, I got to know him very, very well. We uh, actually shared uh, Sunday dinners uh, together fairly often. I think my wife was a better cook than Leo or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, there are several things I remember about Leo. And the main thing I remember about him is foretelling of where he uh, ended up or what he is known for. Because when he was at the forum, uh, he was very unsettled about the fact that uh, a photojournalist um, documents, a photojournalist does not create or direct. They uh, document creatively and skillfully, hopefully, but they they document. And uh, so Leo had to go out and shoot this, that, and the other thing, but everything that he had to photograph, he had very little control over. If the light would have been better at five o'clock if he was outside and he had to take the picture because what was happening was at uh, three o'clock, he couldn't wait till five. And this was, uh, this was kind of unsettling to, uh, to Leo. And uh, so, uh, he was all, there were, there were several pictures, of course, that as a journalist at the forum, he took that he had control over to the extent that uh, he, he was happy and satisfied with. But uh, this was one of the things that I do remember about Leo. We talked about it a few times. Another thing I remember about Leo is that I sent him on assignment to the, to Minneapolis where he eventually ended up, but uh, he came back, uh, uh, on the airplane and came running into the floor and he says, don't do it again. Don't ever send me down there again. I don't want to go back there again. And what had happened is that uh, he was all upset because he had been, I guess they call it profiled and gone through every roll of film and every camera and taken his lenses off. And he had a terrible experience uh, on that particular uh, flight. And it was very, very up, uh, upsetting to him. Well, another thing that, that I, I recall about uh, Leo, uh, this is after, uh, after he uh, left Fargo and was working in Minneapolis. And he got this uh, assignment uh, from the twins to photograph uh, Calvin Griffith. And uh, Leo liked taking pictures. My impression is that he liked taking pictures of things more than of people, but he liked photographing people too. But Kellerman Griffiths gave him 10 minutes for this assignment. That was it. And Leo liked having more than 10 minutes. So uh, when uh, Kellerman Griffith arrived at Leo's studio, Leo had a very, very attractive and distracting hairdresser to take care of uh, those needs. He also had a tailor there. Calvin Griffiths uh, arrived uh, uh, and in Leo's, Leo's mind was disheveled and, and needed care. And uh, so uh, I don't know how long the take took, but uh, Leo told me that the uh, hairdresser and the tailor worked on uh, Calvin for a good 30 minutes before they even started the shoot. So uh, that's one of the, one of the stories that I, I've always remembered about Leo. Um, I've got a couple other things here, but I think I'll let some other people. Uh, okay, well, why don't we why don't we move on to uh, Dan because alphabetically he's the next person uh, on. So Dan, would you like to talk a little bit about Leo? Sure. Uh, I uh, I I know I knew Leo probably the, for the shortest amount of time of the panel. I knew Leo uh, for the last 15 years or so of his life. I, uh, before uh, he published his book, Prairie Landscapes, he had, he had a, a show of, uh, of 35 images that were eventually ended up in that book. Uh, they were, he had a show of them up at the North Dakota Museum of Art. Uh, 
And um, I was invited <laughs> by uh, mutual friends, Eric Hilden and uh, Jackie Lawrence, who were, were photographers at the Grand Forks Herald at the time, to come up and see the exhibit and visit Leo. Leo often asked to stay at friends' homes uh, when he toured the state. Um, <clears throat> Leo was always uh, in a financial crunch. So a lot, he stayed with a lot of people <laughs> across the state. Um, and he was seen with, with the Hildens at this time. And I went up and I, Leo and I just hit it off right away. Uh, we had uh, a great evening uh, at the exhibit uh, opening, but we also visited Father Sherman, uh, who uh, at the time taught sociology at NDSU, but he was also the pastor of St. Michael's uh, Parish in Grand Forks. And um, it was one of those, it was a winter night, I remember, and there's big, big wet snowflakes falling and remember trumpet just trying to walk through the crunchy snow up to Father Sherman's rectory and knocking on the door and not knowing whether he was going to answer or not it took a long time but he we sat around and I think there was some alcohol drunk that night in Father Sherman's uh, I'm not sure exactly uh the details of that, but it was a long night. It ended up at um, Sanders 1907. After the uh, opening, we all went over there and we were uh, given a, a chef's table in the back and served food until after hours. So uh, that was the night I met Leo Kim and uh, it'll be one I'll always remember. Start of a long friendship. I ended up uh, visiting him when he moved to Minneapolis. He lived in the California building for a while, uh, visited him there in his studio. And then when he moved to St. Paul, I visited him uh, at the Tilsner building, another warehouse that was a place where artists lived. Uh, and we had a lot of phone conversations. Uh, and Leo would visit me when he came to Fargo. So um, that's how I knew Leo. I, I have other stories, but uh, we'll tell those uh, later in the show and I'll let the next person. Okay, th thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, we have two Daves here, so I'm gonna call them Sammy and Wally. Yes. Sammy, would you like to talk a little bit about sure. Dave Sampson about uh, Leo? Um, I met Leo when I was 19 years old. I had just finished the commercial art program at Moorhead Tech. And apparently he was looking for an artist to do um, some artwork for a crystal sugar project he was working on. So he contacted the school and got a hold of my instructor, Tom Cavanaugh, who <coughs> gave, him, gave him my name. And so kind of out of the blue, Leo called me and said, oh, I, I need someone to um, do this artwork. So I was 19, still living at home. He came out to our farm, you know, and I showed him the animals and whatever. And <clears throat> he kind of showed me what he wanted. So I worked on this illustration and he paid me 300 bucks, which at the time was big bucks. And he'd, he'd stop out like a couple times a week just to check on the progress of that, and I, I found a copy of that cool. drawing that I had done. It was it was for a promo piece for, for Crystal Sugar. And then after that, he um, asked me if I would kind of be his <laughs> gopher, runner, assistant, darkroom guy. So that was great. So I, I worked with him at the Block 6 building and he had me, um, reprint all of his contact sheets, uh, make prints for him. And then through that, um, we did some other promo type pieces. And this is the days before internet or whatever. So this was his flyer piece that he came up with that we had worked on together. And then it's kind of glossy, there you go. So <coughs> there's some, some mailers that we, we worked on. 
And then another project we did, we did a uh, album for the Johnny Home Band. So we'd go out and he would shoot all the, the live photos. And then I did the layout and I did the, I did the type on the back, but that was with actual rub on type letters. So everything was pretty, pretty old school. And, um, and then during, during uh, lunch breaks, I got to meet the great Dave Wallace and Bruce Crummy would come over for lunch break. So I'd always kind of, you know, followed their work a little bit. And Leo kind of encouraged me. So he had this, he had a great Nikon F2 and his 180 millimeter lens that he let me just borrow whenever I wanted to. And um, so he kind of, kind of pushed me into that direction. So I, I had no idea that I was going to go that route. So he, he also um, saw a little bit of potential in me, which was kind of nice. He, he talked me into going to talk, talking to Colburn to see if I could uh, shoot some sports part-time. So that kind of panned out also. So I, I worked with him for a year until he uh, moved to the cities, but we had an office in the sixth floor of the block six building downtown. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, Wally, that is Dave Wallace, has probably known uh, Leo, probably knew Leo longer than most of us. Uh, Wally, you want to talk a little bit about Leo? Um, yeah, I, um, I can remember the very first time I met him. I had, um, uh, well, actually, when Leo first came to the United States, he ended up in Wapaton, um, which is where I was in high school at the time. I was a senior in high school and he was a very, um, freshman year at, uh, he was an older than average you know, student um, until he could get into NDSU the next year. And uh, I kind of followed him. I was one year at science after high school. And then I came up to NDSU in 1971. And um, I think I had seen some of Leo's photos and work um, kind of through Jerry Richardson and um, um, other publications. And um, somehow I, I think it was Jerry was the one that told me I should go see Leo about um, uh, taking pictures for the, for the NDSU publications, the Spectrum and the Annual. And I can remember going into um, um, into the little office where he was sitting at a drafting table, and I was very sheepishly said, um, "Mr. Kim, <laughs> hi," <laughs> you know, and um, that's how I first uh, met him. And uh, I think one of the things I was wondering, or people may be wondering, why is this archiving uh, large archive being dedicated to Leo. And I think it's, um, there's gotta be some, um, it's gotta have something to do with respect um, be between Leo and one other person, Nick Kelsch at NDSU. I learned so much from those two about um, how to photograph people and, and um, having respect for others. And um, uh, it, it just really stuck with me my whole life. And um, uh, it, it just, it helped me to be able to photograph people. Leo made friends so easily and it was very, and so did Nick. Um, and the way those two could put people at ease before just shoving a camera in their face. I think that was very um, uh, inspirational, inspirational in my life, I guess. And I learned that from, <clears throat> from Leo and, and uh, Nick. And one of the things that uh, Leo would do, and he was the um, editor of the uh, infamous four-part series annual, um, was if there is an assignment, he would give the assignment to both Nick and me and says, whoever comes back with the better photo uh, gets paid. <laughs> and um, 
I think that was one of the ways that, again, Leo's, Leo wanted quality photographs for, for the annual. And that was one way that, uh, that he got them. And um, it, it taught me to really put more effort into my photos because Nick always got paid more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, let's see, I think, um, I think that was about, um, that was probably about all that I had for right, right now. Sure. Okay, um, why don't we move on then? Um, I'd like to talk, have the panelists talk a little bit about the, uh, the influence and the legacy of Leo's work. And also maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the challenges he faced uh, throughout his uh, professional life and perhaps personal life. Why don't you begin again, Colburn, and talk a little, a little bit more generally about that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I didn't see Leo as much as some of the other folks on the panel in the latter part of his life, but I did see him every once in a while because my sister lived in the Twin Cities. And uh, early on, uh, one of the things that I recall is that I, uh, uh, this here again reflects his style, but in, in the studio, he had a room off to the side. And in that room for a major Twin City food production company, he was doing a tabletop setup and it was a table setting, and I, it was going to feature the food, I suspect. Because, but anyway, uh, he went, took me in and showed it to me, and he had his uh, Leica uh, uh, with him, and he had told me he had taken several test photographs. Uh, and uh, anyway, he had worked on setting up that table to his own satisfaction two days. And so, uh, and he still hadn't taken uh, final picture. So that's one of the things that kind of points out to me uh, the way Leo liked uh, to approach things. Uh, the other thing was, uh, I don't remember the exact time, but it was after Leo uh, had his eye problem from the tumor that we stopped in to visit with him. And it was, uh, he was, uh, Jackie and I were both uh, both with him and he was in uh, fairly good spirits and so on, but it was really disheartening to see uh, what, what he was having to, to live with because he still was so much wanted to do everything just exactly the way that he'd always been to do it. And it was, uh, it was kind of a, it was not an uplifting visit, but uh, anyway, uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention, because uh, I've still got them and I still wear them, but I came back from an assignment in Minnesota in cold of winter. I think the temperature had gotten down to 20 below and uh, oh, my hands were so cold. And I don't know how we kept our Nikons working in that weather. But anyway, I complained about it. I'm a person who lets everybody know how cold I am. And I complained and I complained and uh, uh, that Christmas, Leo gave me the nicest, most wonderful pair of snowmobile mitts you've ever seen. Even though I've never been on a snowmobile, I use them. I still have them and I still use them occasionally. So uh, that's, that's one of the things I remember about Leo, but uh, let's, let's pass it on. Dan, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, Leo's legacy? Well, I, I think um, Leo's legacy is that he was able to capture the essence of the North Dakota landscape. That's not easy to do. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I photograph, my, I'm best at photographing people. Leo was best at photographing landscapes. When I've tried to photograph the North Dakota landscape, it's just really difficult for me to capture what it feels like, what you see in three dimensions, uh, the feeling you have being outdoors. It's hard to capture that in a camera, but I think Leo 
really did a good job of capturing that. And I think it, um, it strikes a chord with a lot of people, especially those who have lived in North Dakota and experienced the landscape. In Leo's pictures, they can feel, they can feel that landscape. And I think Leo's legacy is that he did that so well. Uh, so um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Sammy, you have, uh, uh, can you make some comments about Leo and his legacy? Um, I just, I got to see how, how detailed uh, of, uh, of a person he was and how, how hardworking he was. There were often times I would, I would show up there in the morning and he'd, he'd already be there. You know, I can, could never figure out how he would beat me to the office, but turns out he slept overnight there sometimes. <laughs> and, um, for instance, we were doing a photo shoot of a computer, um, not a chip, but a computer board, but he wanted to make it look like it was in outer space. So like Coburn said, he, he spent a whole day just doing the setup and then we would take some fishing wire and hang this, this chip up. And then he took the black backdrop and then I had to light it from behind. And then he would poke pinholes in it to make it look like stars. So. I just would see, you know, how long he would take just to just to do one photo. And he was just super meticulous on everything, no matter what the project was, another project. He he did a little flyer for his church at St. Anthony's. And to get the right color, he had me go out there with the PMS swatch book and hold it up to the brick. So then I came back and told him what the exact matching color was for that project. And I went on a couple other photo shoots. Uh, one of them was at Dynamic Homes down in Fergus Falls. You know, and that was another 14 hour day, whatever. Um, yeah, so I just got to see how, how hard worker, you know, how much he really got into his work. Right. Uh, Wally, did you want to comment a little bit on that? Um, well, as far as kind of uh, his legacy, I guess. Um, the one thing that uh, just really stands out for me is, um, you know, the like everybody else has mentioned, the how particular he was with compositions. Um, and he used a, um, he liked using the larger format cameras, the Hasselblad two and a quarter, and a um, Sinar F four by five view camera. And whenever you're using the view camera, you really have to think about what you're doing because it's not, you can't just grab a quick snapshot with a view camera. Um, that's, I think uh, there's some other things I wanna talk about here a little bit later on about some of the challenges he has and uh, how that relates to his uh, legacy, I guess. Yeah, I, uh, you were mentioning some of the um, <clears throat> practical aspects of uh, what Leo did, the kind of cameras he used. You said that he tended to favor the large formats, even though we know he used 35 millimeter for photojournalism and other things. But probably some of the people in the audience here don't know really what we mean when we talk about large format cameras, particularly in a digital age. Uh, I know my students seem to glaze over a bit when I talk about using uh, a view camera. So maybe um, you could just explain a little bit what kind of uh, approach you have to photography using the kind of camera that Leo, I think favored probably mostly in for his landscapes, North Dakota landscapes and perhaps for, for other things and not so much for his commercial work. Um, so, you know, any, any of your panelists who would like to comment on on large format photography and how Leo used that. Um, I haven't had any experience with it, so I, I have to pass on this one. Yeah, I haven't had a lot of experience with it either, a little tiny bit, but uh, not not extensively. Well, um, number one, you you have to have a tripod, so you really you really have to take a look at what you want to photograph and, and um, uh, 
kind of like the Ansel Adams um, approach, you know, you have to, you kind of have to see the photo and then, because it takes a lot of work to get the view camera on the tripod in the right space, in the right position. Uh, so there's a lot of work involved in that. So the, the pictures you make when you're using a, a large format camera, um, you really have to think about uh, what you're doing. And I think that was one of the things that about Leo is of course the way he uh, kept quality and uh, the image in mind. Yeah, the, the large format really fit Leo's personality. He, another thing with large format is you, you mm -hmm. only get, uh, Leo worked with film and, and so you only get a few exposures often when you're photographing landscapes. Um, there are a lot of stories out there I've heard of, of how Leo would, would just stand there and wait for hours for the, for the light to be just right. Because um, all you can do is adjust the camera. You, you, can't, you can't adjust, you, know, you have to wait for nature to give you the shot. And Leo um, would wait for hours to, to take those three, four, maybe five exposures and then, and then with film, you don't know what you're getting. Where digital, you can check and see what your exposure is and things like that. So it's, it's very, very much a deliberative kind of uh, process. I just pulled up this image in the online exhibit here of Leo in his car here, and you've got his camera set up and the train mm -hmm. image that he took. Nice. Uh, I'm going to leave the last 10 minutes uh, before we open it up to questions for people to say what they'd like to say without asking some questions. And I see Wally would like to say something. I'll, I'll just uh, a quick aside to the, the opposite of uh, the view camera work and the hours that he spent when he was at the forum, of course, you know, he was in a new world and uh, getting used to it. And um, one of the stories, one of the things that uh, he, he was supposed to shoot a baseball game, an American Legion baseball game. And uh, there again, he was trying to figure out where to shoot it. And, and uh, he's using the smaller 35 millimeter camera, which is, uh, you know, very easily uh, moved about and positioned and everything. So he's at this baseball game and he thought, Boy, it'd really be nice to shoot out there by the pitcher, you know, right behind the guy that's throwing the ball. So he just walks right out there during the game on the baseball diamond and the you umpire know, went crazy. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and kicked him out. But uh, Leo, that again, Leo just was trying to get in the good spots. So just a little aside. <laughs> uh, some comments from the other panelists. Something you'd like to add about uh, Leo and his legacy or his challenges? Well, that, that story Dave tells, points out the challenges Leo had as an immigrant, an Asian immigrant who stood out, you know, in North Dakota um, and the culture, the, how he had to learn the, the new culture. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another story that, uh, Kevin Carvel told me about uh, how he and Leo had an assignment to photograph old Highway 10 for uh, the forum. Uh, and they drove, they took the forum car out to Beach, North Dakota, which is on the, almost to the Montana border. And they stayed at the hotel that night, or they, they booked the hotel and Leo, wanted to borrow the car to drive out and take a picture of the sunset that night. And uh, when he came back, he, uh, there were some problems with the car that Kevin noticed. And he said, uh, um, Leo had really didn't, he didn't have a license and he really didn't know how to drive a car <laughs> at this point. He had probably driven 
with the emergency brake on or, you know, the wrong gear or something. So here's a guy, he didn't even know how to drive a car. Uh, you know, he didn't know what baseball was and he's, he's trying to integrate himself into this new world. And uh, to his credit, uh, he did eventually, you know, through people have mentioned his personality, you know, he had a very charming personality. Uh, he loved to uh, tease waitresses. I know I've seen him do that before, things like that, that endeared him to all these um, people he met out in the country. So uh, just wanted to mention that, that uh, Leo's personality uh, made him fit in. Colbert, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say that Leo came onto the scene about the time that uh, cameras were becoming smaller. I remember I had a teacher uh, in high school. And uh, when I was a junior, this teacher demanded that I use a four by five speed graphic uh, to take a picture with. And I wouldn't do it because at that particular time I was using a, a camera that was called a Califax. It was a, it was a uh, imitation of a Rolleiflex that was cheaper. And uh, it was just much more mobile, faster. It was just the type of photography that, that I liked and not, not, uh, um, not the setup and, uh, and everything. And so the, the four by, this teacher saw where my, life was probably going to go. And anyway, so late in the year, I had the opportunity to either uh, lose my position with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, uh, the, the student newspaper or to take the picture as she required uh, with the four by five speed graphic. So I took the photograph and uh, when I was a senior and left school, she said, now someday you'll be able to say that you at least used a four by five camera. So that was uh, the, the kind of the type of camera that uh, the folks are referring to when they're talking about the view camera. Not, not, not quite like that. The view camera is even more uh, difficult to use. But uh, so anyway, I just real came in when uh, 35 was being really exploited in the uh, industry. Wally, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, I don't know if we're coming up on a time here where people are going to ask questions, but I just wanted to kind of along the lines of the, the, the challenges that uh, Leo um, faced. Dan mentioned um, kind of coming to the country and not to the United States and not knowing a lot of uh, things. Um, you know, the, the challenges got, he's always had challenges in his life that he's always overcome. He's always been, uh, that's one thing that I'll always remember him for. And toward the end there, uh, after his tumor and he lost eyesight in his right eye, uh, you know, he was still going out to photograph and um, uh, he was telling me about, you know, how he had lost sight in his right eye. And uh, I asked him something about the, the book or the, the book that he was working on. He says, yeah, I said, I think for the next book, I'll just have photos on the left-hand pages. You know, that's, <laughs> that's kind of an example of even faced with, you know, a photographer going blind, as bad as that is, you know, for his ability to make jokes about it is another thing that I will always remember Leo for. Well, it's about a quarter to one, so maybe we should give some opportunity to those of us who are listening in. Um, I think, Lindsay, you're going to moderate the questions from the audience. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? Please, either you could write it in the chat or you could just uh, let, us, let us know. 
<clears throat> well, while we're waiting, I have one question that I didn't get a chance to ask, and that is, um, Leo's work shows a reflection of something that I think um, we many of us seem to have forgotten in photography here in you know 2021, and that is the the thoughtfulness of taking a picture. And um, I'm not sure if people really understand what it's like to have that kind of uh, sitting back and and a, a sort of a vision of what you want and thoughtfully composing that in the camera. And I wonder, have we lost that in what Leo could do in our photography today? Is it, has it changed? Um, does it, re, does Leo give us uh, something that we can try to emulate and try to move back to? Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to say about that? Or maybe perhaps it's, there's nothing we can say. Mm. I remember the old joke about in the 100 years ago, you took 10 pictures and two of them were awesome. And then in the 35 millimeter age, you took 36 pictures and two of them were awesome. And now in the digital age, we take 2000 pictures and two of them are awesome. <laughs> it doesn't change. I mean, have some questions in the chat, uh, Lindsay. Yes, uh, the first one here we have is what is your absolute favorite picture of Leo's and why? Um, I can, I can go, I've got one here. I like this one. This is mine. Okay, well, I like this one because I have, as a photographer, I've tried to take that image many, many times, waiting for the sky, the rain, the, the beautiful sun, the sun and clouds and landscape and <clears throat> I just I can't I can't do it and Leo can and I think that's one where he uh, it shows his patience his uh, he saw the uh, the picture developing you know the the weather developing set up this heavy duty equipment and uh, and got just the right moment, you know, um, and printed it immaculately. And I, I have a frame print in the next room of it. Any other comments about favorite picture? You know, there's just such a variety. Of course, I've known Leo over the many decades and his, the subjects of his photographs have changed so much uh, that, I, I, I mean, I've seen so many different types of his photos that it's really hard for me to uh, remember any in particular. Um, I, I can remember looking through the, uh, he saved, Tear sheets, which is the uh, of the of the forum, and put those all in a book. And I, I can remember looking through that big album. There were many that I just looked at and said, "Wow, I forgot about that one. How great that was!" So, but I can't specifically put my finger on any one. Sure. Uh, Lindsay, did you want to? Uh... Sure, I'll move to the, next. to the next question. So this might be someone for the archive staff. If um, we've got, um, the question is how many images and negatives does the archives have? Is Hallie, uh, do you know who would be a good they were, they were here. <laughs> oh, there they are. Uh, you mean of Leo's collection? Yes, they want to know. So that's that we've got the archives group out there, I see. And so, yeah, the question is how many images and negatives do we have in the collection for Leo? Mike, you should answer this one. Yeah, Mike. 
our our awesome volunteer Mike Smith, who's been processing the collection. Yeah, Noah Peters. Um, Noah Peters did make a comment uh, on a PM, so I'm just going to go off the memory here. That uh, oh, am I on mute? Or, no, you know, you're on. Uh, that there's about eleven thousand nine hundred slides, uh, over four thousand prints, and the negatives are in the. 15 to 16,000 that we have here. Thanks, Mike. Yep, so you can see why it's taken uh, <laughs> that many hours for him to do 640, 48 hours yep. and still going. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's been really, we've really been thankful for Mike's awesome work he's been doing out there. Um, so the next um, question that we have is, do you think, for this one would be maybe for the panelists, do you think that Leo would be surprised by the attention that his work is receiving now? Uh, I think uh, Leo would be very embarrassed about it and, and uh, humbled by it. I I agree. He, Leo had a, a humble nature to himself. Um, he would be happy, I think, that um, that it did, that it has the audience that it has had. I think he would be ha very happy about that. Now, one thing I remember about Leo and I didn't know him as well as you did was his modesty. Uh, when I last saw him, it was at a a, a benefit at the Hodo, and uh, most many of us who are here today were there. And I said, Leo, I bought your picture, but you didn't sign it. And he said, Wow, my signature doesn't mean anything. I said, Yes, it does. He said, it Does. So he said, Okay. And so he signed it on the back. And I said, Thanks a lot, Leo. This means a lot to me. He said, Nah. Eh. Um, but that's the way he was. He had a very modest uh, approach. So someone's asking for that picture of the computer chip. Anyone have that picture that maybe not obviously available, but that they do they have a, I can't remember which panelist was referring to that photo. <clears throat> right. Oh, you've got it, Dave. Okay. Yeah. So let's, Dave, can you talk so it goes big on your, so your picture comes big? I don't know how that works. There, there you go. <laughs> if you have it on speaker view, then if you talk, we can see it up close. So yeah, I see it there. Neat. It's pretty cool. Awesome. So the next uh, question we've got is if that number of his um, prints and slides and negatives that are in his collection, is that number typical for a photographer's career? That, we, that, that number is shared here in the chat too. We've got like almost 4,000 prints, 30,000 negatives, and almost 12. Uh, thousand slides. Mm. I wonder if those negatives are include all the 35 millimeter. Well, clearly it does. And um, the large format as well. I mean, that would be an enormous load output for large format. But I suppose in a career of photojournalism, 30,000 negatives is probably not large. I don't know. Well, that, that would be less than a thousand rolls of film. And over that many uh, years, uh, it, it's hard to say, you know, when you talk about average, because, um, um, I don't know, it's, it's probably small when you consider a photojournalist taking 35 millimeter film over 30 to 40 years. I, th I think, uh, for the time that uh, Leo spent and the type of photography that he did, uh, right, that's, a, right. that's a massive number. Of, right, that's uh, right, for the type of photography. Our, our, our group, um, Wally and Bruce Crummy and, and uh, Sammy, and we all, we know a photographer who uh, in today's world goes out and uh, shoots maybe a thousand pictures at us uh, at a sports game or some right. such thing. He's worn out shutters on his camera from taking too many pictures and then selecting, whereas people from 
from my era, we started out uh, shooting two or three rolls a game at a, a sports event. And uh, that was considered a lot. And so yeah. um, Leo has taken, uh, with the equipment that he used and with the subject matter and his approach and everything, I'd say that's just many, many more than I would have ever imagined. I was at an event uh, this past weekend, a three-day three -day event, and um, digi digital has just changed everything. This guy in three days shot almost a terabyte, that's a thousand gigabytes of photos, which is, I, I figured maybe 50, at least 40 to 50,000 frames at this three day event. Wow. For, for comparison. Incredible. I hope, I hope he got a good one. <laughs> Yeah, as I say, 2,000 pictures, maybe two are awesome. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, so uh, would the panelists like to say anything, just kind of a, uh, a final comment before we're done with our, our, uh, our um, program today? I can just start. Uh, Leo, Leo was such a great guy and had so much influence on me that um, I, I wouldn't have never gotten into photography if it wasn't for him, you know, and he kind of took me under his wing. And like I said, through him, I met Dave and Bruce and Colburn and he just kind of changed my life in a whole different direction. So if it wasn't for him, I, I wouldn't be doing this today. Yeah, kind of the same with me. Um, he certainly helped me, uh, uh, go off on a uh, different career path. I was in architecture at NDSU, so. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that he made me a better photographer uh, with his, he was always striving for the best quality and, um, I'm still trying to take good landscape photos, you know, when I'm out there. I, I'm always thinking of Leo when I'm trying to photograph a landscape. So, um, you know, and I, I think we, we should point out that um, Leo lived in North Dakota, you know, as an immigrant and that North Dakota accepted him and the way he navigated his life uh, through those challenges, I think is something that um, is a good example for everybody, you know, and, and that he did consider, he really did enjoy uh, North Dakota and its people. And um, I just think that should be said before, before we end as well. Auburn. Yeah, I, um, I think that Leo was a very, as, as it was said, a very humble, serene, and actually a very spiritual person. And I think that th those qualities are reflected in much of his work. And uh, I think that uh, the that NDSU uh, did a magnificent job on uh, putting this collection together and uh, I'm, I'm just very, very impressed with what they did. And I think it's a, a great tribute to Leo. Thank you. I, I would like to kind of add my appreciation to everybody. We are right on time, one minute before one o'clock. Perfect work. Thank you so much. Hopefully everybody who was part of this uh, can uh, be excited about our, our events as we'll be continuing celebrating Leo Kim, especially the homecoming event that we are planning for later this year in the fall and the exhibit that is going to be in the library. Please share your comments, recommendations, either with Lindsay, with me, with any other staff in the archives. Special thanks to all of the volunteers and everybody else. This was spectacular. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Dr. Collins and all of the panelists. And Great I'd like job. to just add a thanks to all the people who are here. I noticed there's quite a few well-known photographers here. 
I see Bruce Crummy. I see Nick Kelsch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic. Thanks so much for being here. We really yeah. appreciate it. And um, I'm glad we could have this opportunity to talk about Leo Kim. Dr. Collins, thank you so much for the plug about photojournalistic collection. This is our uh, aspirational goal for North Dakota State University to continue growing our photojournalistic archival collections and general collections. So all of the photographers, please consider us as, a, as the place to donate your materials. We, we do amazing stuff here. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.